Okay, let's get going. So, uh, we've been talking about various uh, techniques for making data warehousing more efficient. And in particular, we've been talking about the trade-off between performance and, and result accuracy. And if we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy, we can get a huge performance speed up. We're going to continue that today with uh, two concrete examples of sketches, as promised, and uh, a bit of a discussion about uh, various strategies for uh, various techniques for doing what's called online aggregation. Uh, before that, here's a quick snapshot of the leaderboard. Uh, everyone who has thus far submitted uh, Project 3. Um, as you can see, there's plenty of, uh, it, it's a very tight race. Um, so, the sooner you submit, the sooner you get on here, the sooner you get uh, bonus points. Uh, and the more likely you are to get bonus points. Okay, uh, so moving, moving on to the actual content. Uh, we've been talking about various forms of query approximation. And the two strategies we've discussed so far have been uh, using sketching algorithms. We've discussed a couple of specific sketching al algorithms, uh, the count distinct sketch and count sketches. Um, I'll start off today by giving you concrete examples of each of these. Uh, there seems to be a little confusion. And then we're going to talk about uh, various sampling techniques and ways of uh, query doing query evaluation uh, by using only part of the input data. Okay, so let me give you a concrete example of the uh, count sketch, uh, the count distinct sketch, I should say. Uh, so you have a set containing four objects, and the goal is to basically find uh, unique objects. Now the sketch itself, the way it's going to work, is we're going to compute the hash of every object and find the first index with a one in it. Uh, and we're going to call that the, the row function of that. <clears throat> uh, we are then going to create a bit vector containing a single bit at the index indicated by this. So you can think of this as the, you're basically creating a bit vector that contains only a single bit set, and that bit is the first bit in the hash uh, of that object, the first bit that is set in the hash of that object. Uh, we compute a bitwise OR of that hash and get, oh, sorry, of, of each of those individual sketches, and we get a summary sketch of the entire set. And in this case, that sketch is going to be 1011, those are the corresponding bits that are set. We're going to count from the end uh, and find the first zero that appears, and we're going to uh, use that as, uh, and call that R, and then the actual value, uh, the actual number of entries that we're, of distinct entries that we're going to estimate uh, in this sketch are going to be 2 to the power R, and that whole thing uh, divided by uh, this constant phi, which is 0.77351. And that's basically going to give us an estimate of how many entries there are in this sketch. It's not precise, as you can see, uh, but in general, it will produce a, uh, it will produce, uh, a reasonable estimate to within about an order of magnitude. You can use multiple sketches uh, with different hash functions to get different uh, estimates and take the mean of all of them. Uh, and of course, the, the key observation is that because uh, the because the row function depends on the hash, if you take the hash of the same object, you'll always get the same row function. Uh, you'll always get the same sketch, and so uh, no matter how many times you or that sketch with itself, uh, you're never going to change the summary sketch. Uh, so this basically incorporates uh, the distinct operator. You'll, you'll get a count of every distinct value that contributes uh, to this uh, this expression. And not the frequent query, I mean, not the frequent object. I will get to that. Uh, one more slide. Uh, question in the back? Yeah, what, what happens if two, uh, like O1 and O2, they are still distinct, right? Yes, they're still distinct, but, but they have the same. Yep, uh, and that's perfectly fine. So the idea is uh, to create a, a sketch where there are uh, lots of uh, ones in the first column, slightly fewer ones in the second column, even fewer ones in the third column, and so forth. And basically, by sort of measuring the frequency, uh, 
Uh, so, the more items there are, the more likely that this first bit will be set. The more items there are, the more likely that the second bit will be set. And you basically want to use sort of the, this, this sort of measures the frequency. Um, the more bits are set, uh, the, the more items there are, because, or the more items you can estimate that there are in the set, uh, because it would take a very large number of, of these, these values to, to create a, a full sequence of, of ones. Does that make sense? So the, the, the more values you insert into the sketch, the more ones you get in, in general. And the way this works, uh, the likelihood, the, the most ones that you get will be towards the right, the, towards the lower order bits. So as you go up, the, the likelihood drops off. But as you add more items, the, the likelihood goes up. And so you, you basically the more items there are, the, the, the further, the, the more this sort of fills up. Think of it sort of like a, a vat of water. As you keep adding droplets of water, they'll eventually, it'll event, the, the, the thing may be splashing around a lot, but it will uh, eventually uh, solidify. Can there be a case wherein we don't find zero? We're in, uh, oh, yeah, uh, it's entirely possible that the entire thing is going to be zero. Uh, in that case, you just assume that uh, the, la the, the last bit of the hash is a one. No, I'm talking about when we add, and we calculate R, and when we are trying to calculate R, and we don't find a zero there. Oh, when you don't find a zero, same thing. Uh, just, it, that becomes five, excuse me. I didn't get uh, that, uh, you. You just assume that there is a zero at the end of this. You assume that there is a one at the end of this. Uh, I mean, if, if it fills up, then the, whole, me, then the whole thing is full. And you probably wanted to use a larger, uh, a larger sketch anyway, because then you're, you know that your estimate is going to be lower than expected. Yes? Here, uh, 5.2 is like equivalent to the four objects? Yeah, so there are four objects. The 5.2 is, is telling you that there are four. So you said as the zero shifts to the left, the answer will be closer to the actual. No, 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 no. Uh, so as the zero shifts, um, as you get a larger and larger sequence of ones here, um, the likelihood goes up that you have more items. So. Uh, the likelihood of this one being set is one in two. The likely, uh, sorry, one in two uh, to the power of the number of fields you have here. Uh, the likelihood that this one is set is uh, one minus uh, one minus one half to the power of uh, the the number of items set. Uh, the the likelihood drops off exponentially as you get more. Uh, that this one is set drops off exponentially compared to this one and, and so forth. Uh, but the more items you have, that, that increases the likelihood that a particular bit will be set. And so you can, you can sort of guarantee, uh, this is going to be, if the size is one, this is very likely to be set. If the size is two, this is also very likely to be set. Um, and this will also likely be set. If the size is four, then uh, basically the, the more items you have, the more likely the the, uh, the more ones you will expect to see in sequence. Uh, but that's not an estimate. Yeah, like the, so the more ones are there, uh, it means the difference between the actual and the answer we get will be will it be exponential? Uh, so the estimate that you get will usually be within approximately one order of magnitude of the correct answer. So now assuming in this, we have four, all the four ones. Oh, okay, so and all four the ones. R, our R value will be four. Uh, our value will be four, so two to the fourth is 16, 16 divided by 0 0.771, so you'd about 20. You'd estimate that there would be about 20 distinct elements in the set. Yes? Suppose that there is only one item. Okay, so there will be only one hash. Okay. And uh, uh, the bit pattern generated is suppose zero zero one, and uh, you get R as two. Uh, zero 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 one zero or zero 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 one. Zero 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 one. Okay. Okay. And then uh, you get 
Yep, 2 to the 1 divided by 0 0.771, about 3. Yeah, and then, but you have only one, so it does a, I mean, the estimate is 2. Okay. The estimate is going to be 3, uh, which is, it's 2 off, but it's within one order of magnitude. Like I said, the variance is, it, the variance is not low. Uh, the, the This produces a pretty wide-ranging estimate. But there are two strategies. So first off, you may not need a precise estimate. Some, if, if you're uh, willing to take an order of magnitude in, in variance, this is fine. Um, if you're not willing to take an order of magnitude variance, you can use multiple sketches. So run the same procedure, but generate a different hash, a slightly different hash function uh, for each object. So that will give you two estimates. And the variance, it might have a high variance, but the variance is going to be, uh, the, the, the mean of, of the random variable that you're choosing from is going to be the correct value. And so basically by, by taking lots and lots of, of samples, you get a progressively more accurate answer. Yes? I don't exactly get the point of the transformation. So it's, uh, what we are actually estimating is something like a probability of having distinct elements, right? Is it something like that, or is it actually calculating the number of... It's actually, so if I had two copies of O2 in here, the second copy of O2 wouldn't contribute in any meaningful way to the estimate. Exactly, but uh, as I was saying, O1 and O2, mm -hmm. suppose they are, in this case, they're not the same, right? Yes. And we're not taking only O2, only O1 and O2, and uh, they have their last bit set, mm -hmm. right? And then using that, uh, we get uh, our last bit set, and then if we calculate the variance, estimate it comes to three, right? Uh, the so the variance I couldn't give you off the top of my head, but the no, I, I mean uh, the last bit is being set over there. It's uh, okay, so you're you're asking uh, why are these two treated identically? Wh uh, why no, according to this going to this algorithm. Okay. Okay. Oh, if you're just counting one and two. Only, yeah, only I see. Then the estimate you get is, uh, uh, actually, it's going to be, yeah, okay, around three. So that means that we have three distinct elements, right? I mean, it's so it's not, you're not guaranteed to get a precise result, uh, if, if that's what you're asking. You, you will get an approximation of the correct result. Yeah. In this case, O1 and O2 are not the same. If O1 and O2 were the same, then they would have the same bit set, right? Yes. So, you in have that only, case, we would get an approximate result of 3. And even in this case, we're getting an approximate result of 3. Yep. And, okay, let, let, let me answer that in two ways. So, first off, uh, the, the variances are a little bit exaggerated when you get, when you're talking about uh, single digit numbers. Uh, once you start talking about millions of values, an order of magnitude, an order of magnitude difference is, is basically between uh, 10 million and 1 million, or uh, 10 million and 100 million. So you're going to you're going to get a fairly wide variance, but you're going to get in the millions at least. Um, so it's a high variance. Mean, the the difference between one and uh, one and two elements is. I mean that that may be the entire set in this case. But that's not the typical use case of, of this algorithm. This is the, the size is only for illustrative purposes. And what is the application of this algorithm? Uh, you have a very large number. Um, as one example, and we'll talk about this uh, in in a bit. Uh, you might not. You might want to know how many uh, distinct values there are in a set before uh, computing a group by aggregate. So if you're trying to compute a group by aggregate, you're going to need to allocate a certain amount of memory. Uh, for one count for every single grouping term, um, if you can do that, if you can do that entire thing in memory, amazing. Uh, if you can't do that that entire thing in memory, then you'll want to use a slightly different. You'll want to do a, like a hash partitioning step before actually doing the grouping aggregate. Um, and if you have ten petabytes of data, you want to very quickly be able to estimate. Or okay, maybe ten petabytes is a, a bit much. But if you have a, a gigabyte of data. Um, you might want to very quickly estimate uh, how many distinct values there are in that gigabyte of data uh, so that you can figure out whether you should be 
hash partitioning, um, how many hash partitions you, you should create, uh, that kind of thing. But even for running this algorithm, it would require that much of It would require a full scan through the data, but you might, so, okay, let me, let me answer that with two, two questions, so, or two, uh, two answers. So first off, uh, this algorithm, the estimate that you, you get, in order to compute that estimate, all you need is this bit vector. This is a very concise summary of how many distinct values there are in the set. And every time you add new values to the set, you can just update that bit, bit vector. So you can keep this around as metadata for the entire table. Uh, the second thing is that if you're talking about a gigabyte of data, you can still compute out of this. It might still be fairly efficient to do uh, in your planning phase, um, if there's, if you really have no information about the, the grouping attributes, uh, the the query compilation phase, or bit where you're figuring out figuring out which plan to use, and just even which plan, to, how do you partition the data? How many partitions do you create? Can you do the entire thing in memory? Um, if you're doing that, it may just pay off to do a full scan through the data, and uh, you do one quick scan through the data. And maybe it'll take you 30 seconds, but now, now that you know how many partitions to create, uh, that saves you the cost of having to do uh, two repartitioning steps or three repartitioning steps because you chose uh, too few partitions, or the cost of creating unnecessary partitions. So it's uh, granted that that's not something you'll do very often, but it's one one concrete application. Uh, distributed systems also finds this useful because it, you, can, you can very quickly summarize how many values there are on individual nodes. Uh, but you can, very quick, uh, you can sort of combine these values also very quickly to find out how many distinct, uh, how many distinct values there are uh, on lots of nodes. So you have 100 different nodes. You want to know how many distinct values there are across all of the nodes. Um, you could do that by shipping all of the data to one central location, so you could figure out what the, the intersection or you, you'd have, you basically have to see the entire data set in order to be able to get the, the, dis, the number of distinct values. But in this case, each node just generates a summary, and the summaries can get ordered together, and then you very quickly know uh, how many distinct values you have. Okay, does that address your question? Any other questions? All right. So the other uh, the other sketch that we talked about was this count sketch uh, data structure, uh, and the goal of that is to, to sort of find the the set of k most frequently occurring objects. Um, in this case, the goal that I'm going to pose is here's a sequence of objects, and I'd like to find the two objects that occur most frequently. And you'll note that that's basically three and one. So three occurs uh, three times, one occurs three times, and four occurs twice. Uh, two occurs once. And as sort of a, a precursor to this, what we need to do is find the, uh, the estimated, we need a mechanism for estimating uh, the number of occurrences that a, a given object has. Uh, so with, with some constant amount of storage, uh, we want to be able to estimate uh, how many distinct occurrences there are of every object in this list. So once again, we're going to take our hash values, we're going to hash all of our objects, and uh, in this case, we're actually going to ignore everything except the last bit of the hash. Now, uh, this, so this is, uh, what I'm going to describe right now is, is a component. It is uh, uh, sort of the basic building block that we're going to use uh, to build this estimate. Um, taken alone, this is a horrible idea, but taken together, uh, and I'll show you how, how it fits together, uh, it becomes uh, much clearer. So we're going to take each, uh, the last bit of each hash, and we're going to use that to decide either, uh, to assign either plus one or minus one uh, to each object. Now for all these objects, we, we know what, uh, whether they have a plus one or a minus one, and we're going to summarize the entire thing by just summing up all of those values. And 
in this particular case, they all sum up to negative 1. So now we can come up with an estimate kept for the count of the objects. Um, and if you'll recall from uh, Wednesday's lecture, this basically means uh, take the plus 1 or minus 1 of each object and multiply it by the sketch. And that will give you an estimate for the count. Now this is kind of a really bad estimate. Um, so the, uh, what you're going to do to estimate the count of a given object is take the, the summary of the entire thing and then multiply that summary by either plus one or minus one uh, depending on what you determine from the hash. So object one has a plus one here. So we're going to multiply plus one by minus one and then get an estimate for the count as being minus one. Now, as you can tell, uh, sets with negative object counts uh, in general shouldn't exist. Uh, so this is not a particularly good estimate, but it is an estimate, and as we went over on Wednesday, there's uh, sort of a, a, a good, uh, good basis for that estimate being correct. But it, the, the problem is that it has a really high variance. And so we're going to take a very similar strategy to what we did before, um, and repeat the process multiple times. So we're going to build lots of estimates. We're going to build a whole array of estimates, and we're going to um, we're going to use the hash to basically to, to figure out not only which estimates uh, we should be using, uh, but also how to modify them. So in this case, and this is a very uh, very simplified example. Uh, in general, you'd have more than two rows. I'm going to simply say that there are two rows, and I'm going to call this one top and this one bottom. So for each, and I'm also going to uh, take this 8-bit uh, hash and split it up into uh, four chunks. So I'm going to have four columns. And for each, each of those columns, I'm going to pick either top or bottom, or plus one, eh, sorry, top or bottom, and independently, plus one or minus one. You'll note that this corresponds to two bits of the hash. Great. So basically what this, this means is that for every object, I'm going to get a, a, sequence, of, a sequence of these, uh, either top or bottom, and then plus one or minus one. Um, you generate these randomly based on the hash. Uh, the, this is one particular process for generating those. Uh, but basically, the, the, the core thing is that you have, uh, you have for every object and for every column in this, this estimate table, um, you have a row identifier and either plus one or minus one. OK. So now we're going to go through this list. We're going to start with object. Uh, question. Yes. So can okay. example one, how translate from 0, 1 to the bottom? Oh, uh, OK. So that, that's, uh, that's basically, so up, the first item in our list is object 3. And, uh, the first item in our list is object 3. Uh, so object, oh, sorry, you're, you're asking how this translation occurs. Um, Mistake. Um, right. So the the plus one or minus one is one bit of information. We take one bit. Uh, uh, top or bottom is also one bit of information. So we need two random bits to generate a random assignment. Uh, uh, to, to generate a random value of top, bottom, comma, plus one, minus one. So we take uh, two bits of the hash, and that produces top, bottom, and plus one or minus one. Uh, yeah. Uh, or if you had uh, the other, uh, the other, um, if you have four rows, you'll need two bits for top or bottom. If you have eight rows, you'll need four, uh, three bits, and so forth. But basically, you just take what you're doing here is generate randomly selecting one of the available rows, 
and you take however many bits from the hash that you need. Uh, and there are ways of sort of taking a, a random hash and sort of generating more random data based on that hash. But I mean, basically, the, the only thing is that you need you need a random row uh, for every column. You need a random row and either plus one or minus one. And how you generate that is, is more or less irrelevant, as long as it's based on the hash. OK, so we're going to take the first object. We're going to look at the first object, and that's 03. Uh, so we're going to modify, uh, for the first column, we're going to modify the bottom result by minus 1, uh, the top result of the second column by plus 1, the top result of the third column by minus 1, and the bottom result of the third column, or sorry, the bottom estimate, I should say. You pick a random number. Uh, you pick a number of columns and a number and a number of rows. Uh, those the number of columns and the number of rows are parameters to the sketch. Uh, the more columns, the more rows, the more accurate your sketch. Now the row is two to four. How do you get the number? Uh, how do you get two and four? Yes. Uh, those are parameters to the sketch. Uh, the, the higher those values are, the more accurate the sketch, but the more memory it takes up. So it's it basically, you, you pick those values based on the... the, so the top one, last one. Random number? Plus, in this case, plus one and minus one are random numbers based on the hash of O3. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, you want for the first column, you want a de to deterministically select a row based on the. How can fill the table? Oh, how do you fill the table? It starts off as zero, all zeros. Yeah. So it starts off all zeros. Now we're going to look at object O3. We're going to look at object O3 and go through this list. So for the first column, we're going to increment the bottom row of the first column by minus 1. We're going to increment the top row of the second column by plus 1, the top row of the third column by minus 1, and the top row of the uh, bottom, sorry, the bottom row of the fourth column by minus 1. And that's how you get these values. So only, the table is only for both, both three, right? Yeah, so right now it's only estimating the we move on to O1, we do exactly the same thing. Increment the bottom row of the first column by plus 1. So plus 1, uh, plus one minus 1 is 0. Uh, increment the top row of, uh, sorry, the bottom row of the second column by plus 1, top row of the third column by minus 1, uh, top row of the fourth column by plus 1. And we end up with that table. And we can basically repeat this process, iterating over uh, everything until we finally get to the very end of the table, and this is sort of our, our little result sketch. So, how do we actually use this to estimate, uh, estimate something useful? Let's say we wanted to estimate the count of O1. So we're going to take a look at the, the columns that we, ch sorry, the, the rows that we chose for each column. And in this case, we chose the bottom row uh, for the first column, uh, the bottom row for the second column, the top row for the third column, and the top row for the fourth column. And we're going to apply uh, the, the same strategy that we used in the single estimate case. Uh, so we're going to multiply uh, the bottom column uh, of uh, first one by plus one, uh, the bottom column uh, by plus of column two by plus plus one, uh, the top row of the third column by minus one, and the top row of the fourth column uh, by minus one. That's those. We're going to take those. Uh, after multiplying, we're going to sort them, and we're going to take the median value. In this case, uh, the average of uh, four and five, which should actually be three point five and not one point five. Um, How do you get the uh, so minus one comes from this minus one uh, times uh, plus one. The plus four is that plus four times plus one. That minus six is minus six 
times minus 1. So you take the, 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 the value in the row that you selected, and you multiply it by the plus 1 or minus 1 that you chose for that particular column. So it's a massive yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, so, so all of these are plus 1 except for that one, which is minus 1. Plus 5 times, so plus 4, plus 5, minus 6. This is just the sorted order. Sorry, the, uh, these, these are, this is a sorted list, uh, a sorted list of these values times uh, the corresponding uh, plus one or minus one. Yes. Uh, that yeah. So that's a that would be a uh, typo. That should be. Better. That makes sense. Is it average, right? Uh, mean. Uh, sorry, median. Uh, the median takes the middle value or the average of the two middle values. Median, right? Yes, the median. Uh, they, they basically noticed that the median produces a more stable result. So you can do the same thing for, let's say, yes. And this, this is why I have computers do my math for me. Uh, and uh, that should be. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, um, the, the further you get in math, the less you actually need to do with basic arithmetic. Um, okay. So now we want to do the same thing uh, for O3. We're going to basically take the bottom, multiply uh, the bottom of the first column, multiply by minus one. Uh, top of the second column, multiply by plus, plus one. Uh, top of the third column, multiply by minus one, and, and so forth. We're going to take those values, do the multiplication, sort, and then produce an estimate of the number of instances of, uh, of O3 in this case. Uh, so when you're estimating, what, when you're producing an estimate, then uh, you're you're allowed to have partial objects. It's like uh, the average American family has two and a half kids. There, there's obviously not a, a kid sliced down the middle, but uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, basically, to just recap, uh, the, the more hash values you produce, uh, the more accurate the estimate you get. Uh, okay, so how do we actually take, take that and um, compute the, uh, the two most frequent objects in the set? And I'll remind you that's O3 and O1. So we're going to start with O3. We're going to do exactly the same thing as before, keep our estimate. Uh, but now we're going to also keep around a list of the top two items. We keep around a list of a little more, but in, uh, for, for, for illustrative purposes, let's keep around two. So we have O3, uh, and since that list is currently empty, we have space to put the O3 in there. What else needs five? Oh, sorry, that O3, one. One instance of the... Uh, so we... Uh, we have... We're reading O3, we're looking at O3, we incorporate O3 into our sketch, and then we incorporate one instance of O3 into the top K. So for every object, for every object in our top K list, we're gonna keep around the identifier of the object as well as its count. So we currently have one instance of O3. We move on to O1, update our sketch, and again, we have space in our top K list, so we're, in, we're going to incorporate O1 into that list. O4, we're gonna do exactly the same thing, but now our top K list is full. If we wanted to incorporate O4 into that list, uh, we would actually have to uh, do something, we would actually have to 
decide that O4 occurs more times than something in this top K list. So what we're going to do, uh, we don't know anything about O4. We don't know whether we've encountered O4 before. So we're going to update our sketch, and then we're going to use our sketch to compute an estimate of how many times O4 has occurred in the list so far. In this case, that estimate is going to produce plus one. And plus one, well, uh, plus one doesn't occur more times than the least frequent object in our top K list, so we're going to just uh, ignore the O4. But keep in mind that O4 is still incorporated into this sketch. We're going to move on to O2, same exact thing happens. O3, uh, sorry, uh, the next occurrence of O4, however, we now get an estimate based on this sketch of 1.5. We're going to, now 1.5 actually is, is higher than either of these. So O4, correctly I might add, has occurred more times now than any object in our top K list. So we insert O4 into our top K list, and we discard the last object in our top K list. So O3 moves down, and O4 shows up. And we're going to use the estimate that we got here as the count. Now granted, that estimate might not be precisely correct, but it's still a reasonable estimate. If O4 were to occur now, uh, then we'd increment it to 1 point, uh, sorry, to 2.5. Okay, now O1 occurs. Again, now O1 isn't in our list anymore, so we need to look at our approximation here. We're going to update our approximation and get an estimate for the number of times O1 has occurred. And that estimate comes out to be 2. So we're going to do exactly the same thing as before. Uh, O3 falls off the list and O2 uh, arrives. Yes? When O4 has the uh, more count, like when, when we decide to insert O4, uh, like, uh, I mean, on what basis, like, uh, when we decide which one should be? Whichever has the lowest count. And if the lowest count is like, equivalent, yeah. then uh, the top case semantics are arbitrary. You can, you can uh, pick whichever you like. In this case, I picked whichever was inserted last. But you could do first in, first out. It doesn't matter. Yeah, if there, basically, if, multi, if, uh, if k entry spans the boundary, then uh, which, which entry is falling, it, it doesn't matter. OK, so we decide to insert a 1. It has a count of, the estimated count is 2. So we insert that into the list. Uh, 03 drops off. We'll repeat the process. O3 now has a count of 2. Point, uh, now, based on the estimate, O3 has a count of 2.5, which is greater than anything else in, in our top K list. We're going to do the same thing as before. And now, oh, do the same thing as before. And, well, there are only O3s and O1s left in the list, so the only thing we're going to do now uh, is increment. Uh, O3 to 3.5 and increment O1 uh, to 3. Those are not necessarily precisely correct estimates, but again, we're not interested in uh, the estimates. We're interested in how many times the object has occurred. And in this case, O3, is, uh, O3 and O1 are indeed uh, the top K most commonly occurring objects. So is this clear? All right, great. Um, so hopefully that clarifies the, the craziness that was Wednesday. Um, all right, let's, let's see if I can at least motivate this idea of online aggregation in the last uh, 10 minutes, maybe not necessarily go into the algorithms themselves. So the idea of online aggregation uh, is, once again, that you're, you're trying to trade off accuracy uh, for latency. And the idea here is that you're willing to uh, sacrifice accuracy, you sacrifice accuracy by not using all of the input data. You, you take your data and, and you, you sample from it and compute the, the query result based on those samples. 
And for the most part, this basically means just scaling up any sort of aggregate values uh, based on the, the, the fraction of the data that you've seen so far. Um, one of the, the sort of observations here, though, is that as you go through the data, as you generate more and more samples, uh, the results become more accurate. And so in this case, the, the trade-off between accuracy, latency and, uh, and accuracy is actually in the user's hands. So the user can basically decide uh, when the, we can present the user with a sort of a little uh, dialog box that tells you what the estimate is and gives you some uh, bounds on how accurate it thinks that result is as well. So in this case, it's saying that the average is uh, 2.6, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and there is a 95% chance uh, that the correct answer falls within uh, 2.63 minus 0.065 uh, to uh, 2.63 plus 0.065. So we're, we're basically setting up a range of, of possible values, and we're saying that there's a 95% chance that it falls into that range. So how do we do this? Uh, well, the, there are three main challenges that have to be addressed in order to do online. Uh, th so this is, by the way, referred to as online aggregation. And there are three major challenges here. So the first is that in order, to, in order to sample, in order to really, really sample your data, you need uh, random access. You need to be able to arbitrarily pick uh, random tuples in your data set. Uh, if your data is already random, if it's in a, a heap file that has already been randomized, unsorted, well, okay, your, your problem is solved. You just scan through that random data. Uh, this is typically not the case. Uh, so the, the paper that this is based on actually doesn't really expend a lot of effort on, uh, on producing better results. Uh, and in fact, until recently, there wasn't much of a, a better way of, of addressing the problem. Uh, one thing that they do note is that, or one thing that I will note right now, is that random access isn't quite as much of an issue uh, So, uh, due to flash drives. Uh, so this is not quite as big an issue as, as they make of it anymore. Uh, right, so the, the, the two really, really hard challenges, though, are that you might have lots and lots of um, you might have lots and lots of data, and certain pieces of the data might be more interesting than others. Uh, and one example of this is when you have uh, when you're doing a group by aggregate, and there are certain group by columns that where the data that would feed into those aggregate values uh, only occurs infrequently an example of that in a moment. Uh, and well, there's an algorithm that they propose uh, called index striding, uh, which, which addresses this. Uh, the other uh, challenge is, in order to effectively do online aggregation, you basically have to stream the results of a join. And there's most of the join algorithms that we've talked about don't really support this. Uh, even the one that, that does support streaming data from both sides of the join, uh, the sort merge join, uh, requires that the data be sorted, which kind of goes, uh, goes against our, our desire to have random access to the data. So that's not necessarily ideal. Uh, let's see. Actually, we'll, okay. Let's, let's leave it at that, and we'll pick this up uh, next week start with online aggregation and go a little more down. Any questions, by the way, or any questions on the project? On any of this material? Yeah? I, you can compile the tech file, it will generate, uh, I, sorry. Uh, I, I uploaded, I guess I uploaded the wrong file. I'll, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs>